it's four o'clock, right on the uh, Rolex watches here. Um, so, okay, uh, I, I know you, you all know why we are here today. I mean, because you, you have read the, uh, the uh, press release and, and also the, uh, the mail that was sent by the Director General this morning. So I would like maybe uh, uh, first to, uh, I mean, to recall the aim of this seminar. I mean, our, our colleagues from Opera uh, have made a, an intriguing measurement. And uh, after, I'm sure, uh, a lot of and harsh work uh, they have done during ma many months and, and in order to, to understand it, they have decided to, to make it public. And uh, I think the aim of this seminar is, is really to, uh, to, to share this with you, to show you uh, what they have done. Uh, questions from, from your side and, and later from the community. I think this is the main, this is the aim of this seminar. So the seminar Dario Otiero, uh, who is from uh, Institut Physique Nucléaire de Lyon, uh, and he is uh, currently the uh, physics uh, coordinator of the Opera collaboration. So I let him now uh, show you the presentation. Okay. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. So the spirit of this seminar was well uh, summarized by uh, Philippe, and I, I just want to add that we are very happy uh, to be at CERN today. We thank CERN for the uh, possibility that uh, was given to us to give this seminar and also for the continuous support uh, in the operation of the CNGS beam. So as you probably know, uh, uh, today I'm talking on behalf of the Opera Collaboration. Uh, this is a collaboration uh, including 160 physicists from certain institutions and 11 countries, mainly from uh, Japan and Europe. And in, uh, for this special result, uh, we also profited from the collaboration of uh, individuals and uh, institutes which worked uh, with us for various uh, uh, issues related to the metrology measurements. So I just quickly report here uh, many contributions from CERN, from the CNGS uh, group, the survey group, the timing uh, group at CERN, and the PS group. And then we got uh, a very, uh, also a very important contribution from the geodesy group from the uh, Università La Sapienza in Rome, the Swiss Meteorology Institute METAS, and the German uh, Meteorology Institute uh, PTB. So the, the principle of the measurement that we are going to discuss today is uh, it's quite simple. It's a classical measurement. So it's a ratio uh, among a precisely measured baseline and time of flight. So in order to measure the time of flight of neutrinos, we need uh, to tag uh, the neutrino production time. And we need to tag the neutrino interaction time by a far detector, which is OPERA. The other ingredient is the accurate determination of the baseline, which comes from geodesy. And since the, the effects that we are uh, going to see are small, we, we need a long baseline in order to uh, match the accuracy of the timing measurements. And uh, in, uh, in our case, this baseline is seven kilometers. And then the other aspect of this measurement is that this was a blind analysis. So we opened the box after uh, uh, we reached an adequate level of understanding of the systematics. So I will just quickly go through the past experimental results. We had uh, a result uh, from uh, uh, an experiment at Fermilab in 1979, where they were uh, uh, performing this measurement on uh, high energy neutrinos with energies greater than 30 GB. They tested deviations with respect to the speed of light, uh, comparing the muon uh, neutrinos and the muon velocities. And the result was that uh, these kind of deviations were less than 4 times 10 to the minus 5. Then, as you all know, we have uh, the results related to the observation of the supernova uh, 1987A. In that case, uh, uh, electron antineutrinos were observed, uh, mainly from the inverse beta decay, in the 10 MeV range on a baseline of 168,000 light years, which is uh, very long. And this is a negative result, which uh, tells you uh, that there are no deviations within, uh, uh, for less than 2 times 10 to the minus 9. 
And then we had the MINOS result in 2007. This is uh, with the mu neutrinos over 730 kilometers with uh, uh, the energy of neutrinos peaking at 3 GB and the tail extending above 100 GB. Positive, it was 5.1 times 10 to the minus 5, although not significant because it was just 1.8 uh, sigmas. The OPER experiment was designed uh, for another purpose in order to study the uh, mu neutrino to tau neutrino oscillations. So it's a detector with uh, high space accuracy in order to de detect the tau decay topology. Uh, in order to perform this study, the main uh, um, uh, sub-detector is the so-called uh, ECC brick, which is a sandwich of uh, lead plates, which are one millimeter thick and uh, uh, photographic uh, films, uh, nuclear emulsions. And this allows to detect uh, with uh, micrometric accuracy the features of the uh, tau decay. The bricks are passive uh, uh, objects, so they need uh, uh, electronic detector in order to uh, find where the neutrino interaction occurred in the target and uh, uh, also uh, attribute, reconstruct the muons, which are uh, uh, typically particles crossing uh, uh, many uh, walls or bricks in, a, in our detector, and also attribute the time to the neutrino interaction. So there are, uh, uh, in this figure, you see these so-called electronic trackers that we will uh, discuss also for the uh, neutrino velocity measurement. Here you can see a picture of the opera detector in Gran Sasso. So you can see the walls where the bricks are arranged. So the detector is made of two supermodules. Each supermodule includes 31 uh, uh, walls. Uh, we didn't fill completely the detector. You see that there are some uh, empty spaces. And uh, you can see the, br the bricks in, uh, in, this in this wall structure. And then uh, you don't see in details, but there are uh, 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 scintillator planes in between uh, each pair of walls. And then there is a magnetic spectrometer in order to measure the momentum of the muon and their charge. So the, the target tracker is the detector which is in between uh, uh, each pair of uh, uh, brick walls and it's a, a scintillator plane. It's a scintillator biplane with the two views, X and Y. And it's made of module of scintillator strips. Here you can see one module during the construction. So uh, one module includes 64 strips uh, for a, a, a total width of 1.7 meters and a length of 6.9 meters. The strips are led with, are read out with uh, uh, wavelength shifting fibers on the two sides. And the, the 64 wavelength shifting fibers are then read out with a multi-anode photomultiplier. So there is, uh, you can imagine that uh, for each super photomultiplier, a front-end board which is associated to it on the two sides of the module. In fact, the detector, uh, the, the, the AQ system works uh, uh, in a triggerless mode asynchronously by uh, putting together this uh, uh, front-end board. They are distributed all around uh, the detector. And in particular, there are 1,000 of these front-end boards for the, the readout of the scintillator planes. And the data are then output on a, a gigabit Ethernet network. So since the detector works asynchronously, a very important ingre ingredient is the synchronization of all these uh, front-end boards, which is provided by a clock distribution system, which works with 10 nanosecond uh, uh, granularity which delivers the UTC time to all the front-end boards uh, so that then the uh, EATs, which are uh, acquired by each front-end board, can be aligned uh, in time and the event can be reconstructed. And all this system is handled by this uh, Opera Master Clock, which receives a signal from an external GPS. It receives a synchronization system uh, uh, one, uh, every, once every millisecond. And this uh, Opera Master Clock card has a very stable uh, oscillator, which has the stability comparable to a rubidium clock, so that uh, among two synchronization, the time is kept 
with a very high accuracy. All these front-end boards, they are read out with the same concept, which is the so-called mezzanine DAQ card, which includes a CPU with embedded Linux, a memory, an FPGA, which, for instance, performs the tag tagging of the event, the clock receiver, and uh, the uh, circuit which puts the data on the Internet. So here you can see a, a few examples of events uh, detected by the electronic detectors of Opera. Here you have a, a new mu charger current interaction candidate, where you see here the point of interaction, uh, the hadronic shower, and then the muon which is crossing the two super module. This is a neutral current event where you just see the hadronic shower. And these are muons which are coming from uh, uh, neutrino interaction occurring in the rock in front of the detector which will also be used for this measurement. So the, LNG, the CNGS beam is going from CERN uh, to uh, the Grand Sasso underground laboratory over this baseline of 730 kilometers. You can imagine that the full width, uh, half maximum of the beam in Grand Sasso is about two kilometers. And in the picture, you can see also a sketch of the Grand Sasso laboratory. Uh, and uh, on top of the laboratory, you have a, 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 an equivalent thickness, a thickness of about 1,400 meters of rock, which strongly reduced the uh, rate of cosmic rays. We have an underground rate of uh, uh, one million per square meter per hour. So there is a, about a factor of 1,000 reduction we have uh, uh, on surface. And now I will say a few words about the CNGS uh, uh, neutrino beam. So protons are accelerated uh, up to 400 GV uh, by the SPS. And uh, this is done on a cycle which lasts uh, six seconds. And then uh, the entire content of the SPS is extracted in two extractions, which uh, roughly correspond each one to uh, five over, over 11 of the circumference of the SPS and they last 10.5 microseconds, so the extraction is performed by a kicker magnet. The two extractions are separated by 50 milliseconds, and the nominal beam intensity is 2.4 times 10 to the 13 protons per extraction. So this is a pure uh, mu neutrino beam with an average energy of the neutrinos of 17 GB, which is then sent to Grand Sasso traveling to the Earth crust. So here you can see the sketch of the beam, you have the proton line, up to the target, then you have the system of the horn and the reflector in order to fo focalize the uh, positive uh, mesons, which are then sent in this uh, decay tube, which is uh, one long, and then uh, there is a, an hadron stop and uh, two muon detectors at the end in order to measure uh, the profile of the muons which come uh, from the pion decay as the neutrinos. So now we, we, we uh, come to how we select the events related to the CNGS beam. So this is done uh, like in uh, other experiments, like in MINOS or T2K, by using the GPS system. And uh, this allows to synchronize the two sites in order to uh, uh, compare the time of production uh, of, uh, of extraction of the protons from the accelerator and CERN and the time of detection of neutrinos in Gran Sasso. So with the standard GPS systems, you have a accura typical accuracy of 100 nanoseconds. And uh, since the beginning of the data taking in Opera, we were uh, opening a window of uh, 40 microseconds, plus minus 20 uh, microseconds, where we were comparing the time of the events in Opera with respect to the time of uh, uh, the extraction of the protons from the SPS, the so-called uh, uh, T-kicker, plus uh, the time of flight computed by assuming the speed of light. So this is a very uh, broad window, as you see, and uh, it was completely uh, matching the accuracy of the standard GPS systems uh, existing at CERN and uh, in, uh, in Gran Sasso for this kind of uh, coincidences. So here you can see uh, a picture that we published in uh, uh, 2008, I believe, in one of the first papers, uh, or 2007, one of the first papers of Opera, 
where we can see uh, the time distribution of the events recorded by Opera. So this is on a very large window, plus minus 50 milliseconds, and you can see that there is a, a, a flat distribution due to the cosmic rays, but then you see the, the two neutrino spills, which are separated by 50 milliseconds. And if you zoom on the two spills, you can see a very uh, clean distribution of the events which are uh, on time uh, with the beam, uh, practically without background. In fact, you can measure the background by looking, for instance, in this region, and it is of the order of 10 to the minus uh, 4. So this selection uh, uh, procedure, by opening this window of plus minus 20 microseconds, we have, been, uh, we, we have been keeping unchanged since 2006, is just a procedure in order to uh, find events which are on, uh, on time with the beam. So this is another picture in, uh, uh, of a distribution uh, produced in 2008. If you apply this principle, as uh, I, I described before, you, you can see that you, you find uh, two very clean uh, distribution, uh, with, with, uh, practically without background around. But you see also the dis distributions of the uh, neutrinos. They are not flat at all. They are different uh, uh, if you compare the first and the second destruction. And uh, this is uh, uh, due to a different ti real timing of the protons with respect to this uh, uh, kicker pulse uh, trigger. So if you would just uh, attempt to measure uh, the neutrino velocity by taking the average of these two distributions and without uh, accounting for the features of the beam, you would find the different values for the first and the second destruction. So uh, in, uh, in uh, 2006, when we started uh, uh, this uh, work in order to uh, find the events in coincidence with the CNGS, we realized also that we could do better. And in order to do better, one has to take into account these two factors, that the uh, distribution of neutrinos is not flat, because the protons are not flat, and also this different uh, timing. So the need is to measure precisely the proton spills. The other thing that we realized is on the side of the GPS. So as I said, we were using uh, uh, standard uh, uh, commercial GPS for, uh, well, high accuracy applications, but not comparable to what you will see in a, in a few minutes. So this is a picture where uh, the two GPS which were installed uh, in Gran Sasso at the time, and they are still uh, there, are compared to a cesium uh, clock. Uh, so this is the face of these two GPS clocks with respect to the cesium. So you can see similar features. You can see that there are uh, some large oscillations of about 60 nanoseconds. You can also see that there are big differences, so don't look at the absolute value of this scale, but you, you can see that there are about 150 nanoseconds difference on average between the two clocks because they were not uh, precisely calibrated. So the other need uh, in order to go to a more precise evaluation of the neutrino velocity was to uh, have uh, something which provides an accurate time synchronization of the beam. So we uh, have been profiting of a very uh, good collaboration with the CERN timing team since 2003. Uh, this has been really fruitful and brought to this uh, measurement where we joined the techniques uh, used commonly in high energy physics and metrology techniques. And this was a, a major contribution from uh, our collaborators from CERN. So together we decided in 2008 to go to a major upgrade of the timing system. And uh, uh, this upgrade allowed to uh, perform the measurement that I will, uh, uh, I will describe in a, in a few minutes. So the uh, good points of opera for this neutrino velocity measurement are the following. This is a high energy neutrino beam, which means high statistics. And uh, as you will see, the measurement is based on about uh, 16,000 events. So this gives a very good uh, uh, statistical accuracy. And then uh, the other ingredient is this sophisticated timing system, uh, which we decided to install in 2008. And this allows to reach a synchronization level uh, around one nanosecond between the two clocks which are at CERN and in Gran Sasso. And then there were uh, many uh, calibration uh, uh, works on the timing chains at CERN and in Opera, 
in order to bring the uh, knowledge, the systematic knowledge of every element at the, at the nanosecond level. Uh, the other ingredient, as you have seen, are the protons. Uh, we uh, need the precise measurement of the uh, neutrino time distribution through the proton uh, distributions. So we installed a device at CERN in order to perform these measurements on the protons. And then the final ingredient is the knowledge of the baseline. So as you will see, uh, by, with a dedicated geodesy campaign, we managed to reach 20 centimeter accuracy over 730 kilometers. So the result of all these ingredients at the end is to achieve a 10 nanosecond overall accuracy on the time of flight of neutrinos with the comparable statistical and systematic errors. So in this, in this slide you see a sketch of the new system which was installed in 2008. So we didn't want to discard what was already existing uh, uh, operating at CERN and in Gran Sasso. So at CERN, there was one of these conventional receivers from Symmeticon, which is called XLI, which is the timing source of the general machine timing chain at CERN, which uh, then feeds all the timing of the acceleration. So there was this receiver from uh, ESAT, which was working uh, since uh, the, the 90s. It was already used by the uh, macro experiment. And this was uh, sending the time underground so we, we decided to install a twin system, which is, uh, the, there are two uh, setups completely equal in Gran Sasso and uh, at CERN, which include a special uh, receiver for time transfer applications, which is called uh, Polar X, which is coupled to a cesium clock. And then uh, there is a, a, a DAQ system which continuously compares the time, every second compares the time of this uh, special receiver with the time of the standard receiver. And this allows us to compute the corrections. And the same thing is done at CERN. So this allowed us to improve the systematic accuracy to reach a synchronization at the nanosecond level, but without touching what was already existing both at CERN and in Gran Sasso. So this slide is rather technical. I, I will go quickly uh, through that. Uh, one point that I would like to stress is that uh, these kind of techniques that we have been using are uh, maybe unusual for high energy physics, but they are quite common uh, in metrology for time transfer application between uh, the many metrology institutes which are operating uh, in, uh, in uh, Europe. So this uh, Polar X uh, uh, receiver was characterized by the uh, Royal Belgian Observatory and it was already used in time transfer uh, uh, measurements. So the frequencies, uh, the reference frequencies provided by a cesium clock and then the receiver is capable of uh, performing an internal time tagging of uh, uh, it, the one PPS which is synchronous to the cesium clock with respect to the individual satellite observations. And you get the data offline which allow you to perform uh, all the corrections uh, which are uh, needed. And these data are written in this format which is called the CGGTS. Uh, and the other point is to use this uh, uh, code which is called the P3 which is uh, based on the measurement of two different frequencies in order to uh, get rid of the corrections due to the different uh, speed of light in the ionosphere with respect to the speed of light in vacuum. So I, I say that this is a, a, a sorry, this is a, a study and established a permanent link at the one nanosecond level between the reference points at CERN and in the, in, uh, the opera timing chain. So here you can see a picture of the two uh, systems. So this is the, sorry. This is the, the installation, uh, this is the installation operating at CERN in the CCR in uh, Prevestan. And this is the installation operating in Gran Sasso. So you see the uh, high accuracy system side by side to the standard one, which was operating in, in Gran Sasso. There were three clocks. We were working uh, with this one and we have been working for all the data taking with the same clock. So a few words about the GPS. You know that uh, the GPS allows to find your uh, position on the Earth. Uh, well, it's uh, more general than that because it, it, resolves your, uh, it resolves your four vector 
in fact it determines at the same moment uh, x, y, z and your time uh, x, y and z they are uh, described with respect to a geocentric uh, system uh, with uh, a, a Cartesian system with uh, the origin uh, at the center of the earth and you can find uh, your unknown by performing four satellite observations so this is a system of uh, four equations in four unknowns which allow to determine at the same uh, time the, the position and the time. So this is the standard GPS operate, operation. Then there is a special operation which has been used for this so-called the common view mode. So there we know already the position because the position we, we can measure um, uh, from time to time with the GPS data and assume that it's stable. You will see later how it is stable. And then by knowing the position, you can just uh, find out your time. And uh, if you do it on two places, uh, two distant places of the Earth by looking at the same satellite, you get some, uh, 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 you benefit that the, some uh, systematics of the uh, transmission of the radio waves in the ionosphere will cancel out. And the reason is that uh, the distance of the satellite from the Earth's surface is 20,000 kilometers, which is uh, quite large with respect to the distance among the two sites, which is 730 kilometers. So by doing this common view mode, which is something that you have to perform, uh, it's an, ana an offline analysis that you have to perform, you can uh, uh, accurately synchronize these two places at uh, one nanosecond level. This is yet a, a kind of standard technique in, uh, in metrology. Okay, this is what you see when you perform uh, this kind of, of offline analysis. So these are the corrections uh, with respect to the standard GPS that uh, you have seen uh, at this kind of oscillation. So at the end, the corrections correspond to the blue points. Uh, the red points are before uh, quality cuts on the uh, quality of the signal from the satellites. Also, this is a, a standard procedure in the analysis of this data. And then you get these kind of corrections. Every point is uh, computed for a neutrino interaction in opera. So you see that there, there, there is an offset between the standard GPS clocks at CERN and Gran Sasso, the pre-existing one of about uh, in between 200 and 300 nanoseconds. And then you see the oscillation of the standard clocks, which are corrected by this uh, high accuracy device. Okay, so uh, by itself, uh, this, uh, these two systems were calibrated by the Swiss Institute of Metrology, METAS, and uh, their specification, they were corresponding to this uh, one nanosecond level uh, synchronization. Uh, we could have uh, believed that, but uh, when uh, we uh, knew that uh, there was this result, we decided to go through a completely independent uh, uh, confirmation by another uh, metrology institute, which is called the PTB in Germany. So they took data with a portable device, which was already used for this kind of operation in order to synchronize the U.S. Naval Observatory, which handles the GPS, to uh, this uh, PTB institute uh, in Germany. So they took data for uh, two weeks at CERN and in Gran Sasso, and they found an offset of 2.3 nanoseconds with an error of 0.9, which is completely compatible with the calibration accuracy of the two uh, GPS detectors, PolarX GPS detectors from uh, METAS. Now we, we come to uh, the timing of the protons. So for the, in order to measure the timing of the protons, we used a, a fast beam current transformer uh, detector, which is uh, installed on the CNGS uh, beam line. This is a device with large bandwidth of about 400 megahertz. And uh, it's coupled to a waveform digitizer, which works at one giga sample per second. And the, uh, the, the acquisition window of this waveform digitizer is triggered by a replica of the kicker signal. So we use the kicker signal just as a kind of pre-trigger to open a, a window in order to find events in Gran Sasso and to start the digitization of the protons. We do not use it for uh, accurate uh, timing. So these uh, uh, waveforms which are acquired by the digitizer, they are UTC stamped and stored in the CNGS database, database for each 
uh, spill. So this is a, a quite uh, large amount of data. We have uh, really the uh, proton waveforms for each, uh, for all the spills which have been extracted to the CNGS target. So here you can see a picture of the device. It's this small one. It's not a large one. Uh, during a calibration which was performed uh, in 2010 by injecting the signal from uh, the cesium clock in the test input of the BCT. So the, the, the shape of the protons, as you have seen, is not flat. It depends on the way the uh, beam is uh, produced uh, uh, by the PS and injected in the, uh, in the SPS. And uh, this is done, uh, half of the SPS, roughly half of the SPS, is uh, filled uh, with five turns of the PS. So the beam which is contained in the PS is shaped with an electrostatic septum. So there, these are the uh, five parts of the beams in the phase space which are then injected in the uh, SPS. And the, this operation uh, implies quite some uh, large losses which are are actually limiting uh, the performance of the CNGS. Uh, we cannot go uh, beyond uh, a certain uh, limit which is uh, 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 due to radio protection uh, uh, requirements at the level of the PS. So these losses then they create the structures that uh, you see here which are related to the five turns. And uh, as I was saying before, uh, all this relies on the fact that the SPS circumference is 11 times the PS circumference. So you can fill it with uh, uh, two injections from the PS, and each one includes these uh, five terms. So this is, this is an example of the waveforms which are measured by the, uh, the BCT. Uh, so you see that there is uh, this oscillation here, which if you zoom, it corresponds to the uh, radio frequency in the SPS at 200 megahertz. So you see the, uh, the separation of five nanoseconds corresponding to the SPS radio frequency. 